For many years, the exotic forests of North Canterbury have supplied timber for local industries and recreation for New Zealanders. Severe gales at irregular intervals have damaged them over many years, but in the early hours of August the 1st, 1975, a hurricane with winds of about 100 miles an hour struck the forest. Morning revealed a scene of terrible destruction, with millions of trees smashed or uprooted in state forests and private plantations. This was the damage in Airwell State Forest near Christchurch. In this particular forest, most of the mature trees were blown down, although many of the younger stands remained almost undamaged. The high proportion of old stands made the Canterbury Forest particularly vulnerable to wind damage. The vast extent of the damage in North Canterbury posed three major problems. First, how could all the uprooted or shattered trees be used? It was about 10 years normal supply of timber for local markets on the ground. Second, how long would the timber last on the ground before attack by wood-boring insects and wood-rotting fungi made it useless? And third, the hot, dry summers of North Canterbury would soon turn the blown-down trees into a major fire risk. The best way of disposing of large amounts of wind-thrown timber was surplus to local requirements was to export it as logs. Contracts were negotiated with Japan and China and logs were shipped initially through the port of Timaru and subsequently from Littleton as well. However, the very first thing that had to be done was to clear block roads and regain access to the forests to enable logging machinery and felling gangs to get into the damaged areas. In spite of the difficulty of moving in the tangle of trees and debris, felling gangs from both the Forest Service and private contractors soon got to work. In a very short time, trees were coming out of the wind-thrown areas in ever-increasing quantities. The trees were hauled from the forest to landing. They were cut into log lengths and loaded onto logging trucks. Clearing the devastated areas was difficult and dangerous work. There have been two fatal accidents, in spite of rigid safety precautions being enforced at all times. Clearing the devastated areas was difficult and dangerous work. There have been two fatal accidents, in spite of rigid safety precautions being enforced at all times. Trucks loaded with logs were soon a common sight on the roads from Hanmer in the north to the Selwyn Plantation Board Forest, south of Christchurch. Most of their loads were delivered to a railhead, where the logs were loaded onto trains which would take them to Timaru. But many logs were sent direct to sawmills, with smaller logs going to factories to be chipped for particle board or fiber board. The main railhead was established at Balmoral Forest, but in the early stages, logging trains were also loaded at Kayapoi. Before the logs were loaded onto the railway wagons, they were inspected for insect or fungal attack to ensure they were suitable for export.
six trains a week arrived at the port of Timaru carrying logs for export. A large stockpile of logs was built up on the wharf to enable more than one ship to be loaded at a time. When the train arrived at the wharf, the logs were again examined by timber inspectors who looked for insects and fungi which might have damaged the timber or which could prevent the logs being exported. This is damage caused by the grub of the hoo-hoo beetle. These holes were made by the wood wasp. This dark stain shows the presence of a fungus. All rejected logs were removed to a separate stockpile and marked. They were eventually sawn or sold for firewood. After the timber inspectors had finished, the logs were removed from the train and stacked on the wharf. Then they were loaded onto the ships, first in the holds and then as deck cargo. By mid-1976, the port of Littleton near Christchurch was also being used to export logs. Some of the wind-thrown logs were not exported but were used by local industries. Most were sawn into timber by local mills. In this Christchurch mill, truckloads of logs were offloaded for debarking prior to sawing. After sawing, the timber was put through an anti-sap stain bar and then sorted into sizes and grades on a turntable. All the milling off cuts which were not usable as timber were chipped. Almost nothing was wasted at the mill. But all the sawn timber produced by local mills could not be used immediately. So a sawn timber stockpile of surplus wood was established on the outskirts of Christchurch. The stockpile will hold about 19 million board feet of sawn timber, which is dipped in chemicals before being stacked to protect it against fungal attacks. The sawn timber is expected to remain on the stockpile for two years or more without deteriorating. Logs from wind-thrown areas were also sent to factories like this one near Ashley which produces fiberboard. Because logs, which maintain a high moisture content, are not susceptible to invasion by fungi or insects, a decision was taken to follow German experience with wind-thrown logs and set up a stockpile under sprinklers for later sawing. So a sprinkler system was established at Balmoral Forest and a stockpile of over 20,000 logs was built up. Every three or four months, selected logs in the stockpile were sampled to measure their moisture content and to identify any microorganisms which may have invaded the wood.
Algae and slime covered the ends of some logs after a few months of storage, which might give the impression that the wood was deteriorating. But when ends were cut off, the wood was in excellent condition. This was confirmed by sawing slime-covered logs which had been in the stack for a year. They yielded clean timber. But while all this work was going on, forest managers were facing another major worry. Fire. Hot sun, drying winds and little rain soon started to dry out the logging slash and the shattered trees. Substantial increases in the numbers of chainsaws and tractors in the forests introduced additional sources of fire. Fire precautions became even more important than they normally are in Canterbury. But for years, the Canterbury forests have had a well-established firefighting organization. Lookouts, like this one above Ashley Forest, are manned day and night during high-risk periods. The lookout tower at Airwell, 150 feet high, gives a good view over the whole forest. The fire watchers are able to pinpoint the location of a suspected fire. They can telephone or radio information to forest headquarters so that firefighting teams can be alerted. The fire station at Ashley Forest shows some of the equipment available on the spot to forest managers, including a number of firefighting vehicles and monsoon buckets, which can be filled with water and chemicals lifted by helicopter and the mixture released over the fire. But the blowdown posed special problems because of the number of machines working in the forests. Every evening, when logging contractors had finished work for the day, a fire officer inspected each logging site to ensure there was no danger of fire during the night. But in spite of all these precautions, fires do break out. At Hanmer Forest, gale force winds fanned the embers from a small land clearing fire, which then moved into mature stands. Large areas of standing trees and some blown down trees were burnt. The timber was not destroyed and was being recovered along with the wind thrown timber. Another potential problem was that insects harmful to timber might breed freely in the burned or wind-thrown trees or in stockpiled logs. This is one such insect, the hoo-hoo beetle, which is commonly found in dead trees. The female lays her eggs in cracks and crevices in the bark. When the larvae hatch out, they bore into the wood and make extensive tunnels in it. The timber becomes useless for structural purposes, although it can be chipped or pulped. The wood wasp is another harmful insect which penetrates the bark when laying her eggs. The larvae damage the wood by tunneling into it. But a fungus put into the egg-laying hole by the female affects the wood as well. Other wood-boring insects may also invade the fallen trees. Some insects do not tunnel into the wood, but live under the bark, like these little grubs which turn into blackish beetles. Stringent regulations prohibit the export of logs if beetles are present. Staff of the Forest Research Institute marked selected logs, then took wood samples from them at regular intervals throughout the year to see what larvae, if any, were present and what damage they had done. The logs were in a variety of sites, covering a range of tree species, tree ages and wind throw damage. Surveys of this nature were done in all the state exotic forests of North Canterbury. 
The logs being studied were marked with a special marker to make sure they would not be moved or interfered with by forest staff or contractors. In addition, adult insects were trapped, particularly in the summer season, as a check on their identity, movements and population growth. Insects did not, in fact, become a major problem in the wind-thrown areas, in spite of almost unlimited breeding material. Research staff were also closely involved in studying the effect of wood-rotting fungi on the fallen timber. Examination of the blown-down trees showed that in some areas, fungi had invaded the wood after about a year. The fungi concerned were quickly identified. Wood samples were taken and the moisture content of the wood, which is a vital factor in fungal growth, was measured. Samples were also taken from fire damaged trees in Hamler Forest for further examination in the laboratory. But inspection on the spot showed that where the trees had dried out, and where the bark was damaged, fungi had already invaded the wood. Research on the effect of wind on plantations has been carried out in the wind tunnel of the School of Engineering at the University of Canterbury using model trees. Although the work is done by university staff, the project is sponsored by the Forest Service. Research was initiated as a result of earlier gale damage to Airwell and other forests in 1964. The effect of wind strengths on the model trees is filmed in slow motion for further study. This effect may vary with different tree spacings and the locations of the trees in the group. This research may provide information which could influence future planting techniques in North Canterbury. When all the usable timber has been extracted from a wind-thrown area, the logging slash and debris is windrowed. That is, it's pushed into lines by bulldozers or root rakers to provide clear spaces for replanting. The windrowed slash is burnt where it's safe to do so or left to rot down. The areas cleared in this way are then replanted and the forests of the future begin to take shape. These newly planted areas, together with the young stands which escaped the storm, will have a much better age class distribution and a smaller proportion of mature trees will be at risk at any one time in the event of future hurricanes. In the years to come, these young trees will once again provide timber for industry and work and recreation for people. In spite of the possibility of future storms, there's still a very good case for well-planned exotic forestry in Canterbury. There are good local markets, adequate land, good roads, soundly based wood using industries and export ports close at hand. With sound planning, the North Canterbury forests will continue to play their part in the economic growth of New Zealand. <laughs>